Good evening, and thank you for being here in the midst of these challenging times. My name is Scout Meredith Best, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. When we held Clark Forum events in person, we took a moment to acknowledge that the land on which we gathered belonged to Indigenous peoples for centuries prior to European settlement. Currently, I am inhabiting the land of the Osage and the Massawamek. I encourage everyone watching tonight's program to take a moment after our presentation to acknowledge the tribes uh, whose traditional lands you currently inhabit. On behalf of Dickinson College's Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues and the Departments of Religion and International Business and Management and the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Reengaging Research Through Citizen and Community Science. This event is part of our semester theme, Civic Engagement and the Liberal Arts. Citizen science has led to innovation, creative exchanges between scientists and ordinary citizens, and meaningful personal growth for participants. Extending offers to help with scientific projects in the broader community, scientists can both benefit from a wider range of data, as well as demystify the scientific process, permitting for a collaborative effort as well as an increased appreciation for scientific efforts. One of the best known examples of citizen science is the Christmas Audubon bird count, which has endured for more than 100 years and includes tens of thousands of participants. I grew up in a rural area and I learned to, how to identify birds, flowers and tadpoles and snakes. My family and I would often share this data with local biologists in order to gain insights about diversity in the area. This early introduction to citizen science positively influenced how I viewed nature, collaboration, and exploration. So without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Jennifer Shirk is the Interim Executive Director of the Citizen Science Association, where she works to foster collaborations with citizen scientists. Additionally, she is affiliated with the Cornell Lab of Anthro Ornithology, where she works in informal learning environments to boost public engagement. Her research interest focuses on citizen science for research and conservation. There will now be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please type any of your questions into the live chat next to this YouTube video at any time. Thank you for attending. Dr. Shirk, you may now begin your presentation. Well, Scout, thank you so much for that introduction. I am so pleased to be with you. I will, and I appreciate the chance to, to talk to all of you as well as your opening um, with a land acknowledgement. And although I can't be with you in person, I am speaking to you from the land historically owned uh, by and uh, lived upon by the Lenape people. And I myself am from those lands. Although today I reside in Brooklyn, I am from the land of the Lenape people in South Central Pennsylvania. So as a fellow Pennsylvanian, um, I am pleased to be with you virtually in this space tonight. Um, I'm also really pleased to have a chance to share some thoughts on this field and the work that I have had a chance to do in it. And I I've been really fortunate to connect with this field of citizen and community science at a point of growth in its history. And I'll be sharing with you tonight some stories of engaged research through citizen and community science. From my perspective as a field builder, as a researcher of environmental conservation, and perhaps most importantly, as a participant in projects in this field. And this is something that I've actually been involved in for long before I had words to describe it. This is in fact me long enough ago that this is a picture from an actual slide camera. I was fortunate as a teenager to have a chance to attend an Earthwatch expedition two weeks in Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula as part of a, an expedition, a research team doing sea turtle research. Um, and that was a formative experience in my life. But I have to say, I had already been involved in things that today I would call citizen science growing up, spending time with my mother who worked in a state park um, in southeastern uh, Pennsylvania, using the protocols from Stroud Research Center 
um, monitoring streams, looking at macroinvertebrates, um, and and really having a touchstone for later in life. Uh, as a college student, I came across. A, uh, lo and behold, the Alarm Project, the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, mentioned, and it was mentioned in the volunteer monitor newsletters that I was archiving as a work study student in uh, the, the bowels of the Bard College field station where, where I worked in the library. And what captivated me about all of these experiences and projects was the idea that no matter what I was doing, that I had a chance that I could be part of asking real questions and advancing knowledge that had meaning in the world. And that was, was truly inspiring to me. And it wasn't until the mid 1990s through work as an intern at Shavers Creek Environmental Center that I stumbled into the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And suddenly there was a name for this phenomenon that I had experienced and seen. And that name was citizen science. So citizen science is something that can be hard to define, something that's much easier to describe, but as a starting point, I'm just going to offer this. It's a collaboration where members of the public participate in research to meet real world goals. And, you know, with this as a, as a starting point, I had a chance to be involved in some of the earliest work as a grad student where I soon discovered that there were many other names and many traditions, one of them being volunteer monitoring. And I was really pleased early on in my career at Cornell and through the Lab of Ornithology to work with a number of people, including Dr. Candy, Wilder Candy Wilderman, who's professor emeritus at Dickinson College and founder of Alarm, uh, together with a number of people thinking and writing about similarities and meaningful differences across these traditions and different terminologies and ways of engaging the public in real world research. Um, and th this is really the heart of the idea that, that drew me to these practices. The idea that whether we call this volunteer monitoring or we call it citizen science or collaborative research, that all of these approaches offer the power of science for everyone and the power of everyone for science. And that's some pretty big territory. So what I wanted to do tonight was think together about the different pieces of this idea and share some stories that I see within that as part of this approach. And I wanted to start with science. So we're probably all aware that this is not an easy time in the world for things like facts. And facts are something that people often associate with science and consider science to be a body of knowledge. So there are some good reasons to bring critical questions to large institutions and traditions and science is central among them. But acknowledging that, there are also persistent strengths to science. And, and I prefer to think of science as a process, and that's a process of developing defensible knowledge, of making observations, of gathering and processing data, of questioning and re-questioning through a rigorous approach to understand something that's new, something that's useful, and something that's important. And this process has become something that's often considered as owned by people called scientists. But that itself is really a recent concept. And the process, this process that I've just been describing, long predates that. And, and we can think about these traditions of building knowledge going far back into history to the time of Aristotle. But I'm going to start only as far back as 1880s. And think about the, the things like the discovery of numerous previously unknown Jurassic period specimens, including this fossilized remain of the first ichthyosaur, which was carefully uncovered and documented in detail here in journals by Mary Anning, who um, 
was from a family of fossil collectors, people who lived on the edge of, of poverty and made their living by collecting and selling these fossils. But Mary took a uniquely different approach to this, really investing herself in, as I mentioned, understanding and documenting what she was seeing. And although she never in her lifetime got true credit for her discoveries or for her contributions to the museum specimens, which she discovered and shared. Uh, she now gets credit for, um, as I'll read to you here, uh, quoting someone uh, very central to the history of, of London, um, that Mary Anning by reading an application has arrived to that degree of knowledge as with professors and other clever men on the subject. And they all acknowledge that she understands more of the science than anyone else in this kingdom. So setting aside that Mary would continue to be denied access to an acknowledgement by houses of learning because she was a woman and not just a woman, a woman who was living, as I mentioned, on the edge of poverty. Even so, with the distance of history, we can recognize that these barriers to acknowledgement weren't barriers to her contributions to knowledge, to the intellect and the rigor that she brought to the process of science. And moving ahead uh, less than a century, this is Dr. Arthur Allen, who carried that appreciation for the contribution of amateur experts into the birth of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is the place where the term citizen science was coined in the mid 1990s by Rick Bonney, my, um, my mentor and supervisor in the 15 years that I spent at the, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And this, this relatively new term actually described work that had been underway at the Lab of Ornithology for many decades. And that was this practice of engaging many amateur experts who together could paint a clearer picture of bird populations. And that brings us to the chance to think about the power of everyone for science. Because the reality is that scientists can't be everywhere. And when we can see that research is not the exclusive domain of people who hold PhDs, and when we recognize that those PhD scientists can't be everywhere, we can start to think of ways to tackle scientific questions of a scope that really previously was beyond the capacity of, of science itself. And we know that today we face global problems, including a pandemic, including climate change and its impacts. And these are all problems that we need to confront with the best available information. Even when the questions that we ask about these things require massive amounts of data to even wrap our heads around what's happening. So even though citizen science has been happening for a century, I wanna show you here a snapshot of just one weekend of observers in, uh, in this case, the Great Backyard Bird Count, contributors to the eBird platform, which allows people to share their sightings of birds from anywhere and at any time. And together over two days, this happens to be just in 2016, so a few years back, uh, hundreds of thousands of checklists were submitted by people around the globe. So we know that contributions from eBird and other global scale projects are starting to fill in the gaps. And that in some cases can be for better or for worse. And I wanna share with you here data from a 2019 study just a year ago published in the journal Science by scholars at the Lab of Ornithology and elsewhere who looked at uh, not just global data, but in this case, continental data from citizen science projects, among other sources, including eBird, including the Audubon's uh, annual Christmas bird count, as well as other collaborative research efforts. And it's not a pretty picture, but it's insights that we otherwise could have overlooked or easily dismissed as anecdotal. So when we see that 2.9 billion birds have disappeared since 1970. Um, 
we can think about that without citizen science as someone otherwise just saying, I'm seeing fewer birds at my feeder. And stories like that, anecdotes like, anecdotes like that carry far less weight than everyone together documenting that we're seeing far fewer birds each year. In this case, this study shows one out of every four birds are gone since the time of 1970. So leveraging the input of amateur experts is powerful. Um, and it helps us to see these, these really important trends that we need to be aware of. But this power can't be taken for granted. The, the eBird project launched with the idea that people were already keeping track of birds and they were keeping their bird checklists and notebooks. And sometimes their notebooks were disappearing into shoeboxes into their closets. And rather than um, those data being lost to history, wouldn't they gladly instead put those data online if they knew, if they only knew how this would help science? But that turned out not to be the case or not as simple as that, despite a fancy marketing campaign to that effect. And the project limped along until the pivot point that you can see here of around 2006, when the eBird team decided to hire, to, to flip that marketing campaign on its head and instead hire four experts from within the birding community and to reframe the eBird platform as a service, as a place where people could safely save their own lists and build their own personal data archive. It was only when the eBird platform and team knew what motivated participants that the project really took off to now archiving hundreds of thousands of, of checklists and observations, um, not just on an annual basis uh, or, or uh, over time, but now on an annual basis as well. And eBird for one has continued to excel at both building data sets and serving the community obs of observers. Most recently here with the launch of an eBird mobile explorer, something that's billed as an exciting way to discover new places to go birding and find the species that you want to see. Um, and this service not just shares what's being seen where and things that people want to go and see, but it shares in an easy format, the navigation of how to get there faster. So it's by listening to and striving to understand what will engage people that citizen science projects can become more engaging and, and therefore better utilized and stronger sources of information all around. And new research that, that cuts across the broad field of citizen science, so far beyond birding, um, that includes things like cancer research, among other things. Um, across these, these many different kinds of citizen science projects, new research just this year by the Pew Research Center shows that at, at around one in 10 um, US adults indicate that they have taken part in a citizen science project within the past year. And I would suggest that these statistics are actually now even higher. Um, with COVID-19, people are turning to citizen science as a meaningful way to do something that matters while stuck at home. And just as one indicator, uh, just last month, um, the Global Big Day, another eBird mobilization project, in a single day, received more checklists than throughout the first, the whole first two years of eBird's history. And this is a large part, um, not just due to eBird's success, but engaging people at home in these, in these new times. So that really gives us a chance to think about the, the power of everyone for science. But I want to really dig into what, what I mean by the power of everyone. And we can't overlook them when we're talking about one out of 10 Americans, that really means a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives. And 
we can't miss the fact that science, any kind of science, takes place in a, in a complex social context. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, and again, with my history of doing sea turtle monitoring, which is shown again here, not something I've personally taken part of, but a picture of another project run by the US Fish and Wildlife Service that really reminds us that these projects don't engage just volunteers. They engage um, the idea and the imaginations of media and of resource managers and politicians and our neighbors. And these projects, when we think about them from the perspective of a citizen science organizer, we have to think about far more than whether or not people want to participate in a, in a research project. We need to think about these varied perspectives that people bring to that endeavor. And sometimes people frame this in terms of citizen science as a weakness, but if treated thoughtfully, the best citizen science projects engage that as a strength. And I want to share a story to illustrate this of another sea turtle researcher. Um, in this particular case, a scientist by the name of Jane Nichols, someone I had a chance to interview as part of my dissertation research uh, when I was really looking at what scientists saw as meaningful in investing their careers as researchers in citizen science, something that could be considered a risky process. And I spent a lot of time talking to Jay who's based at the California Academy of Sciences and who at the time when he started this work was a grad student working through funding with an Earthwatch project, something that I had experienced as a participant. He was a scientist funded to bring people along to take part in this research and share their labor and their perspectives and their, um, their energies to getting the research done. And Jay was working with black sea turtles in Baja, Mexico, and this was a species about which little was known except that it was in decline. And he set out to answer some basic scientific questions. Where were the turtles? Where did they go after they came ashore to lay their eggs? What were they eating? What risks did they face? And Jay was in the process of answering these questions, but also facing that reality that the turtles were disappearing. And he reflected to me this sentiment, and here I'm quoting him, this idea, Jay said, that you collect data and then you use those data to manage a species at risk or an ecosystem at risk. That makes sense. But he went on to say, I was realizing that that's certainly not enough and not just not enough, but the connection between the science and conservation action is pretty weak. Something else needed to happen. And for Jay, that something else began through partner partnering, not just with Earthwatch volunteers, but also with local fishermen in communities, people who had been called by management agencies, turtle hunters, because what they fished for were turtles. Um, and and these, were, these were people whose cultural heritage and identity were linked to the turtle populations. These fishermen had boats and they had knowledge. They knew how to find the turtles and they knew where the turtles were and what they were eating. Um, and through these partnerships, which started out as um, paying fishermen to take the team out to find turtles, relationships and networks evolved. And little by little, a group called the Turtle Group, the Grupo Tortuguero, was, was born and now conducts regular monitoring by communities of sea turtles. And through this network, collaborating scientists have been able to access data that have resulted in scores of published papers. But as importantly, they've resulted in changes in practices and perspectives and sentiments about how people interact with turtles, um, with communities starting to host festivals and education events um, and changing 
the ways that turtles are harvested and managed with greater appreciation for the interactions between people and the environment. And slowly the black sea turtle population has begun a recovery. So I know we can't pin the recovery of that species on any one aspect of this story, but it is a story that gives us hope that these collaborations and networks, when we think about the power of everyone and the many perspectives and insights that can come together for science, we can start to look at problems in new ways that leverage the knowledge of many people. And that story also gives us a chance to really think hard about what can happen and what's possible when this power of science is available to and leveraged by everyone and anyone. And the way that that can expand, not just data for science, but also the questions that we even ask and, and start to answer. One of the things that it's, that it's really important to acknowledge is that science that's held within institutions has limitations. And there are pressures on science that results in biases of where scientists go and what they ask and what they look at. And things that um, scientists are rewarded for are things like publications and new grant funds. And those don't result from every kind of scientific question. And the things that often get overlooked are the science that has applications on the ground. But when individuals and innovators and communities uh, have taken ownership of science, of the tools and processes of building knowledge, um, these communities and, and individuals have started to draw attention to previously overlooked problems. And here I want to briefly share the story of the birth of a now well-known and well-established project called Public Lab, which grew up in response to the Gulf oil spill and the actual um, barriers that were put up to people um, and scientists documenting where the oil was spreading and who was being impacted by the spread of that oil. And people were, were blocked from accessing beaches and from going out on the water to really see the extent of what was happening in response to the, the spill. So public lab innovators, even before this was formalized as a project, put their heads together and developed some low cost sensors and tools in this case, what you're seeing here is um, a digital camera that's housed within a plastic soda bottle and launched in a balloon, but people also used kites from the shore to get up and above and over the, the spill to capture pictures and then using some high tech, tech um, approaches to stitching together digital imaging, uh, really showing, actually capturing and showing where the oil spill was, uh, who it was affecting both wildlife and people um, throughout the, the extent of the Gulf and, and really bringing attention to the power that, that science in the hands of individual innovators could have in capturing and demonstrating the impacts of problems. And, and this is an approach that's been exemplified by the Alarm Project at, at Dickinson, where the local knowledge, the insight of experience and familiarity of a place uh, can help us not just capture data, but make sense out of data. And here is a, is a picture that I'm told by now a director of Alarm, Julie Vastine, who I'm really proud to have the chance to work with on the board of the Citizen Science Association, uh, is taking part in a, in a data interpretation workshop, um, which engages uh, local community members in making sense out of data. And this is not a story that I'm going to tell. These are stories of alarm that I hope you have a chance to hear and capture from within the community that you are based in there at Dickinson, um, because there are so many powerful stories of this project. But alarm, suffice to say, is really on the front lines of the field of community science. Um, one approach to doing, doing research that is embedded in and owned by communities. 
And that's an approach that to research that has particular relevance in um, frontline and fenceline communities where too often these environmental injustices of things like pollution, of health impacts, um, air and water, uh, compromises to the quality of air and water, among other things, um, the, that these environmental injustices are often paired with economic and racial injustices as well. And it's in these contexts where the term community science has particular significance, um, where there's a history of science both exploiting people and extracting data and knowledge and the chance uh, for um, and the history of people instead driving um, science through community pri priorities and really governing the um, ownership of that process of science uh, is really at the heart of what is called community science. So I want to pause here and and just uh, share that we've we've touched on a sense of each of these elements, the power of science, science and everyone, um, the power of everyone for science. And I wanted to share before we close out one story that that gives us a chance to look at these things and ways that they can come together in the development of a single initiative. And this is a, a, an endeavor that I was uh, really honored to have a chance to take part in through invitation about five years ago um, among a team of people to look at the potential for citizen science in a fishery management context, specifically here in the US South Atlantic where um, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council is tasked with um, both the monitoring and the management decisions of, um, the, of fisheries closures. And it's a, it's a really complex policy context where what's at stake includes not just resource sustainability, but also people's livelihoods and their sense of history and identity. Um, and for many fishermen, their deep appreciation for the bounties of the ocean. And this is also a complex ecological system where this council, which is a multi-stakeholder council that engages fishermen, industries, um, data managers, state agencies, federal agencies, and others, um, all have the responsibility for managing along the South Atlantic coast, which uh, spans from North Carolina down to the Southern tip of Florida, which you can see pictured here. So it's a big area. There are over 80 species. There's recreational fisheries, there are commercial fisheries. Um, it's a deep ocean water and it's a complex um, bottom where the, these species interact in various, uh, various layers um, in, a, in a vertical system. And the council is tasked technically through the federal management system with specifically using what's called the best available information to make decisions. And everybody knows that in this complex system, there just isn't enough information about most species to really capture what's actually happening out there. And that can result in, um, in decisions that really <laughs> can be controversial because everybody knows that there's a huge need for more data people are seeing different things, whether they're using the lens of being on the water and seeing the fish firsthand, or they're using the lens of the numbers and the information that are coming in through rigorous scientific studies. And there was a huge opportunity for citizen science to play a role in addressing these data gaps. But there were also incredibly high stakes where we're talking about things that have impacts on people's lives when it comes to fisheries closures. And, and there were big questions about this approach. 
And those included what was already happening. For example, could fishermen trust decisions that were made based on limited data that don't match what they're seeing out on the water? And on the flip side, could data scientists trust data from fishermen who could, an argument could be made, have a vested interest in access to the resource? The approach that the council, um, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, the council for short, the approach that they took was to um, spend a year planning a big meeting that convened people from across the many stakeholders that were involved, about 60 people who came together and spent three days looking at the possibilities of citizen science and the problems that they were facing and making these hard decisions. Um, and long story short, they came out of that meeting putting faith in the sense that they all had a common goal and that was making well-informed decisions in support of sustainable fisheries. And they put a good faith effort towards developing not a citizen science project, but a citizen science program, a real approach to putting the planning in place that could later lead to the development of projects on solid footing that met the needs and the priorities of everyone involved. Um, they set forth this vision, and while it's now changed, what I'm sharing with you here is that initial vision from the meeting, which was that through more collaboration, they could generate more data and generate more trust that could lead to better management um, with a mission of improving that management of fisheries through this collaborative approach to science. And um, over the past uh, several years, what they spent their time doing was to divide up into multi-stakeholder volunteer action teams or A teams for short, that spent time developing the, the approach to considering big questions like um, what could be researched, including um, what might be proposed by, by fishermen? Could we uh, consider research questions and processes proposed by fishermen? And how would we do that? Um, big questions like how resulting data would be assessed and how those data would be managed, including who owns the data and has decisions about, makes decisions about how those data are used. Um, and, and these included things like how to recruit and train participants, even how to partner and finance these projects with an eye towards sustainability, not just of the fish populations, but of this endeavor uh, that, that was growing together. So after several years, this process is now uh, codified in a set of standard operating procedures that the council can use to run any citizen science project as the need and opportunity arises. And they, they did in the meantime, pilot a project. They decided to tackle um, a low hanging fruit of something that wasn't terribly controversial, but was consequential in the sense that the data collected could actually be put to use in a near-term stock assessment, the evaluation of um, whether or not data could be used to um, consider the, the closure of a fishery. And, and this was looking at reports by fishermen of releases, the, the discards, um, the, the fish that were thrown away, of a particular species, in this case, scamp grouper. And um, they developed an app um, and the app is in use. And I just wanna share two quick insights as I, as I watch this process unfold because the, the project itself, including the development of the app and the, and the way the project would take place was also multi-stakeholder driven. And it was really essential to have fishermen among others involved at every step in the process because they shared insights, including things like, um, you know, geolocation, something that is 
integral to app-based citizen science is just a, an easy check to know um, as a matter of course with a phone where data um, are coming from. It's just something that phone apps do. Um, we know that things can be geolocated. But Fisherman shared that not only is location data sometimes very sensitive and proprietary to fishermen um, who don't want to share where they are, but from a practical perspective as well, when you turn on the geolocation feature on a phone, it runs the battery down really fast. And so fishermen routinely turn that off when they're going far offshore. Um, and in this case, scamp are a, a species that's caught several miles offshore. So that was really critical to know. And if those data were necessary, where the fish were, they needed to come up with another way of um, reflecting that. And just as another practical course, if you think about the use of an app by a fisherman on a boat that's moving in deep ocean waters, um, one hand always has to be on the boat and another hand often is involved with um, working with the fish or um, the fishermen who are going out on the boat, um, on, a, on a rental boat um, to, uh, to catch fish. Um, everything has to be done one-handed. And so the design of the app itself really had to accommodate the way that it would be used by the end users. And these are just snapshots of some of the critical insights that went into um, the development of this project. Um, and that project is off and running. It, it's, it's a, it's, it remains to seen whether any of the projects will work because all of these things all of these projects in a management context are a long game. And I, I, I wanted to share here that uh, everyone invested in this effort was really invested as well in the utility of the data and making sure that when people, fishermen were spending their time to share what they are seeing, um, the power of their observations magnified out on the water and their experiences. And, and, and I have to say that that's embodied here in this image, a photo that was um, gifted to me and to uh, my partner in this work, Rick Bonney, um, my supervisor at the Lab of Ornithology at the time, a photo that was taken by fisherman Jimmy Hull um, and, and printed and, and given to us with this sentiment of just imagining what we could do with this knowledge together. Um, and, and I know that it's going to take some time for these projects to come to fruition, but through some interviews that I did with the, the A team members, these volunteers who had invested their time in building the program, all of that infrastructure, infrastructure was uh, that I heard back that they were invested in this long term and that even if that first pilot project didn't turn out to be a fast win as they were hoping, the process itself of building and launching this program has, has on its own developed relationships and developed trust in the process and a sense of resiliency in the program and what can be done through, through many projects into the future. And just to share one last perspective, um, if folks are still questioning as to whether partnerships can thrive between sportsmen and scientists, I want to circle all the way back to that um, publication in the journal Science that came out from Lab of Ornithology scientists a year ago uh, with dismal statistics from citizen science about the fate of birds across the continent. And the fact that although um, the majority of, of bird categories, groups of birds have seen dramatic declines, there's one category where there have actually been um, upticks and positive stories to tell. And that's in waterfowl. And um, this is due in a large part to conservation efforts that have been spawned through collaboration with sportsmen, um, in this case through um, organizations like uh, Ducks Unlimited, where sportsmen are um, invested in the, the fate of these birds that they love and they happen to hunt, but want to see care taken in the preservation of 
um, the species and the habitats that they live in. And through these collaborations, um, complex conservation efforts can unfold, but it does depend on ways to approach them through developing shared understandings and appreciation for the ways that we go about leveraging everyone's skills and insights and experiences. And the last thing that I'm gonna share before I close out tonight is that this isn't true just of individual citizen science efforts. It's true of the field of citizen science itself. And I've mentioned briefly that I'm the director of the Citizen Science Association. One of the things that we stand for is integrity in both science and engagement. And what we do is to bring people together who are running and managing and leading these projects from many different perspectives. That includes conservation, that includes communities, um, that includes cancer research and these many disciplines and approaches to doing this work and doing it well. Um, we do it through sharing web resources, uh, through working groups, through a peer reviewed journal. And we're mostly known for um, doing a conference where I have to say with a bit of amusement and appreciation that in 2019, um, I, I had the great joy of seeing the fishermen that I worked with in the South Atlantic get a chance to meet and talk with um, hunters, wolverine trappers from Alberta who are doing similar things in a very different context um, to, uh, to do a work in different places in different ways and still find a shared connection to engage around um, and, and share practices. So this is why we exist um, to uphold good science that can be done together and the many perspectives it takes to make that happen. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to the many people whose stories I've had a chance to learn from and share here tonight, including um, fishermen, including public lab, including alarm, um, and uh, with gratitude to the funding sources that I've been able to leverage, including from the Pew Charitable Trust to work with fishermen in the South Atlantic. So thank you all. Um, I've, I've been uh, so pleased to have a chance to be with you um, in spirit tonight. And I look forward to continuing this conversation and ideas. Thank Scout. you. Thank you, Dr. Shirk, uh, for the amazing presentation. Um, I would like to encourage folks, if they have questions, to uh, put the questions in the chat since the Q&A portion of the event has now begun. And our first question um, concerns the air quality in uh, Cumberland Valley, since that's a uh, serious issue in Dickinson's home. Um, and um, the question is, do you have any resources for citizen science um, that relate to monitoring air? Scout, you muted yourself at the end of the question, but I will say yes. Um, and uh, here is where I turn back to the community of folks who know more about specific areas of research than I do. And I would say that there are great resources out there um, through organizations like Purple Air. Um, I've had a chance to work with groups in the Carolinas where we um, recently held a conference in 2019. Um, so there's groups like Clean Air Carolina who have done this work and I, I know that they would know um, groups in and around Pennsylvania or have resources to share. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency um, has also innovated in this area and has, shares standards and resources. And I know they're about to release some new resources for communities who are undertaking monitoring um, and where they can go for protocols, for tools um, and, and other things. So there, there are great, um, uh, more people out there who can say more about that. And I'm happy to be a conduit to that information if useful. Thank you very much. Um, our next question uh, um, ask, um, last and provides a little bit of background. Last week, the New York Times ran an interesting article on citizen science and the strange mating habits of alligator lizards in Southern California. Are you aware of any other projects that involve scientists and citizen science observing animal mating behaviors? I am fascinated by that. I am a New York Times subscriber and a herpetologist, and I have missed that article. I look forward to reading it. Um, mating behaviors. Uh, wow, that that is 
um, there, there are at this point so many projects out there in the world. There isn't one that's coming to mind with the possible exception, I will say, if you consider it a mating behavior, frog calls um, and, and frog call surveys in the spring. Um, another, and, and here I'm pulling on my experience in herpetology, which uh, although I've done sea turtle research, I've actually done more research with amphibians. Um, so I, I, I love that. Um, I, again, will look forward to reading that article and I'll have to dig into that a little bit more to see if, if there are. I will say that behaviors sometimes are things that are harder to capture um, through citizen science because they're hard to describe and characterize. Um, and I will say that that's not a barrier to doing citizen science because uh, citizen science projects continue to innovate and move the needle on what's possible um, but it is something that I know has been a little bit more difficult to, to tackle in the field of, of research in general. Um, for those of us who are feeling inspired after tonight's event, what are some concrete steps that we can take to get involved in citizen science projects? The absolute best resource that I would say in general for, citizen sci for finding a citizen science project is the website size starter that's s c i like science starter um scistarter.org is where you would find it and this is an organization that started by um, my friend and colleague and, and an amazing innovator in her own right darlene cavalier who really has invested time into building community among um, volunteers and inspiring people in finding and taking part in citizen science projects. It's an easy website to navigate and there are great search terms for projects near you or on topics of interest to you and even filters on things like does it have educational resources or does it require equipment? So that is the number one place that I would send people. Thank you. Our next question, from your perspective, are there some fields of science that are more conductive to successful citizen science projects, or is there a field that has uh, not yet tapped into the power of citizen science? Um, at this point, I would venture to say, I, I would be surprised if there wasn't a citizen science project to be found in almost every scientific discipline. Um, one of the first things I had a chance to do in this field back in 2007, and actually it's where I first met uh, Dr. Candy Wilderman who founded ALARM, um, was a, um, a small workshop at the Lab of Ornithology where 60 people put their heads together around best practices in the field. And one of the questions we thought we might answer was, what was and was not possible <laughs> in citizen science. And, and I have to say that everything that we thought we might have benchmarked at that meeting, we've, we quickly decided that wasn't a question that we could answer, but things that we did think we benchmarked um, as things that weren't really doable through citizen science were quickly knocked down as people continued to bring new and innovative approaches into ways that we can leverage, capture, um, energize uh, the, the knowledge of um, people who have knowledge in this field and the, the energy or the motivation to contribute to it. And I mentioned very briefly that this includes things like cancer research, um, epidemiology. There have been research projects confronting the COVID virus really on the front lines where the virus is, um, what the protein structure is of related viruses. There's a project out there called Fold It, which invites people to um, essentially solve um, the complex puzzles of how proteins fold. And uh, so it's just about every, every possible um, research inquiry area, um, I would venture to say has a project in it at this point. Thank you. Um, for our next question, are there qualifications that can be achieved as a citizen scientist that are equivalent to degrees in higher education? How can that power dynamic be diminished or do you believe it will always exist? Um, I think this is something that we're going to continue to confront and there aren't a lot of easy answers to it. I think that um, there are still some um, reasons that the scientific academy 
exists and institutions like that are, um, are, are not things that will change overnight. It's, it's a, a really big deal that um, scientific institutions are starting to slowly embrace this practice even of citizen science and other open science practices. Um, I, I haven't seen anything at this point that would replicate the, uh, the process of a degree but I would say that there are projects where individual contributors and groups of contributors where we can start to see and build practices that can effectively serve to acknowledge and recognize the expertise that is something that's owned by an individual or a community. And, and one of the areas that, that doesn't directly confront the, the heart of the question that's being asked here, um, but one of the areas where I am doing a lot of learning and listening right now um, is work particularly in environmental justice contexts where um, individuals and communities have lived knowledge and experience of a place and of the impacts of pollutions, uh, of pollutants. Um, and where scientists too often come in and want to um, learn what they know and then essentially take that knowledge back, publish papers um, that, that may have no relevance to or impact on the real problems at hand and looking at ways that partnerships can be built and structured in new ways um, where communities can be um, treated with equity and with parity, including um, not just acknowledgement for the knowledge, but support for the work that's being done. And this can take many shapes, including financial support for the investment that people are making into things that aren't their livelihoods, uh, that they're going above and beyond to invest time in something that has very critical um, importance in their lives and on their lives. Thank you. Our next question actually touches on this a little bit um, more and asks you to expand on the role of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the citizen science field. Yeah, I, I spoke to it just a, a bit in, in that previous answer, but I will um, add a different dimension to that, which is that this is something that we need to be thinking about systemically across science. Um, and across institutions. And so it, it needs to be reflected, not just in how science is done, but also how we act as um, influential pe uh, people, individuals in the process of developing the systems and structures um, that take shape in science. And it's something that I am working hard to, again, listen and learn and take action on as my own organization, the Citizen Science Association, which is still fairly young and has a chance to think about these things as we start to um, institutionalize, as we start to build the structures that define us um, and make sure that we can bring, um, and I, I would encourage and say it's essential for any individual citizen science project to do this as well, bring an equity lens, a lens of equity and justice to um, everything that we do throughout uh, our development. And for our last questions, have scientists who collaborated on citizen science projects shared how their understanding of science has changed? Oh, wow. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I love that. And I will say that um, this is really what I invested my dissertation research in trying to understand and capture. And I will say that the best part of my dissertation uh, was the stories of these nine scientists that I had a chance to interview um, deeply over time um, and, and have them share their stories of the ways that their perspective shaped the work that they do and was changed by the work that they do. Uh, I mentioned that Jay Nichols was one in his sea turtle research, uh, Candy Wilderman was another. And so, uh, these first person stories are the heart of my dissertation and um, with the permission of these individuals, I, I look forward to having the chance to, to share them. Thank you very much, Dr. Shirk, and thank you for everybody who attended tonight's presentation. Be well.
Thank you, Scout. And thank you all for being here.